So thank you. Thank you for the presentation. And thank you for the possibility to give a talk here. Actually, I haven't been to IMPA for more than 10 years. And I think last time I was here when there were a conference related to 70 years of Jean-Jacques Riesler. And then I had never coming here. Actually, it's a pity, and I just enjoy IMPA very much, and I like to be here. But uh, unfortunately, the situation was that I didn't visit. So that uh, what I'm uh, talking about, uh, just uh, I uh, wrote very ambitious, uh, the very ambitious uh, title, Metric Not Theory, and uh, er everything I will be talking about is uh, based on the joint works with Andrei Gabrielov, Misha Brandenburski, Zbigniew Jelonik, and Alexander Fernandez. So that uh, we will see. Uh, that there are some, also some contribution of Edson Sampaio here. So that what is the subject? Really, it is a sort of strange discovery that we had uh, with Andre and Alexandre when we were working on the ambient, uh, actually with the, uh, with the outer ellipse geometry. So l l let me introduce what we are talking about. So where we are. When we speak about the ellipse geometry of the objects, and my objects will be uh, semi-algebraic, sets or definable sets in or minimal structures. And uh, who doesn't know who are definable sets can uh, think that I'm talking all, uh, always about semi-algebraic sets. So when we talk about Lipschitz geometry, then there are several uh, classification problems or several equivalences. The, the first one is the inner Lipschitz equivalence. So that, let me come a little bit back, then if you have a semi-algebraic surface, actually I will speak uh, just in the uh, measure of the time on the two-dimensional semi-algebraic sets, then we have two natural metrics. Uh, just we have a structure of the metric space, and there are two natural metrics that one is the inner metric, okay? And the second one is the outer metric. And you will see that there is a really, uh, just a obvious relation between them. And then we have just a special object, normally embedded sets, or in other, in other terms, now the people say LNE sets. So Lipschitz normally embedded, and sometimes uh, it corresponds to the quasi-convex sets. And just in analysis, uh, the people who work in analysis or uh, work in differential, uh, let's say, or in PTE, they use quasi-convex when they, we actually mean Lipschitz normally embedded. What does it mean? It means uh, that uh, when the outer and uh, the inner metric are uh, by Lipschitz equivalent, okay? Then we have two natural metrics, and then we have three uh, classification problems, or three Lipschitz geometries. The first one is the inner equivalence, right? A classification with respect to the inner equivalence. And then the classification with respect to the outer equivalent. Uh, outer, the, the natural metric from the ambient space, 
and the ambient Lipschitz equivalents when we have the uh, just where here where we consider the outer equivalents we just uh, consider the maps who are by Lipschitz with respect to the outer metric but the, the, the those maps are defined in X and Y right and when we speak about ambient Lipschitz equivalents then we have to have the by Lipschitz homeomorphism defined in the ambient space okay so the question is uh, what are the relations relations of these three Lipschitz geometries and uh, especially this kind of uh, question of normal embedded uh, normal embedding it was just uh, recently attacked by uh, plenty of people and there are some of them over here for instance Maria Parasida and uh, that uh, the usual question about Lipschitz normal embedding, you have a given equation, and you have to know if the outer and inner metric are by Lipschitz equivalent or not. Okay, and here there are some examples. For instance, you see the horn, right, which is a revolution surface uh, over a cusp, right? And here you see another horn and uh, these two things are, uh, if you have uh, just the same exponent over here and over here, then these two sets are inner by Lipschitz equivalent. But uh, if you have the phenomena like this, as here in the picture, then you see that the inner, it, it means that here the two points are approach one to another much faster than over there. Okay? So you have here a unique exponent with respect to the inner metric. And here we have a different exponent with respect to the outer metric. And you see that inner metric knows nothing about this, right? So then it shows that the classification with respect to the outer metric is quite different uh, from the classification with respect to the inner metric. And uh, we actually, we never thought about the ambient classification. When I was, uh, uh, started to work on the outer classification with uh, Alexander Fernandez and Andrei Gabrielov, we just occasionally asked what happens uh, between ambient and outer, right? Okay, one can say, right, they are obviously not equivalent. Why? Because they can be not topologically equivalent, right? But if we suppose that there is no topological obstruction, what happens? So then uh, actually my talk will be related to that. Suppose you have two uh, semi-algebraic sets such that they are outer Lipschitz equivalent, right? Suppose that they are also ambient topological equivalent, right? Then the question is if they are ambient by Lipschitz equivalent. So then, and the, if the answer is no, the question is how many no? What do I mean by that? How many examples we can have? So let me start from the obvious, from the most obvious example of two curves that they are topologically equivalent.
outer lip should be equivalent and not ambient lip should be equivalent. The two curves in R2. So the, there is a green cusp and there is a blue cusp, right? So that we can draw here a blue cusp and here we continue and here we draw a green cusp. And we suppose that these two cusps are different, that this cusp corresponds to the exponent, the green cusp corresponds to exponent 3 over 2, so, so here 3 over 2, and here the cusp with the exponent 5 over 4, and here 5 over 4, right? So that the cusp with the exponent 5 over 4 here looks inside and here looks outside, right? And when uh, actually uh, this one looks inside and here looks outside. So these things are ambient Lipschitz equivalent, uh, sorry, ambient topologically equivalent. And then they are outer Lipschitz equivalent. But not ambient Lipschitz equivalent. So it's the simplest possible example as I know, right? And somehow uh, this example is of the finite type. That means the following, that if we just define the outer metric, then there are finitely many examples that equivalent to that with respect to the outer metric but not by Lipschitz ambient equivalent. So this example is actually very simple. And, but when we speak about germs, so germs of the curves in R2, R2 then, the outer Lipschitz equivalents implies ambient. Okay. So then this is the basic example, and from this basic example, the natural question is what about germs of surfaces, okay? What about germs of surfaces? So then we have two uh, places where one can consider this kind of equivalence. Uh, one is the germs of the surfaces in R to the two, uh, R to the three, and another in R to the four, right? So, and what will be the tools? How one can compare uh, that kind of germs? Okay, that another thing that uh, I didn't mention that for it's actually uh, is not related to my talk, but when we speak about inner metric, then any germ of semi-algebraic surface 
is by Lipschitz equivalent to the to a germ of a horn, so the a revolution surface of a cusp. And now, what about complex curves? And the, the, there is the as Juan was talking here about the knots, right? He considered the knots of the uh, related to the complex algebraic curves, right? So the, for the complex algebraic curves, the situation is somehow uh, trivial. Not, not trivial, but there is actually nothing. That outer in situ germs who are outer uh, by Lipschitz equivalent, then they are ambient by Lipschitz equivalent. Here I mentioned found this here Fernandez, but actually one should add Neumann and Pichon. And Pichon. So for the surfaces who are actually uh, complex algebraic curves, nothing happens. Right? So then, what about real surfaces in general? So, what will be the tool? The tool will be considering the tangent cone and some pi theorem. So, the, here is the definition of the tangent cone, okay? So, when we have a single surface, then we have a tangent cone. There, uh, the definition is written, but I will explain a little bit better for someone who doesn't know that. Uh, so when we have just the same algebraic set, right, what we do? We just make an intersection with the small sphere of the radius epsilon, and then we make a renormalization. So we just send this intersection to the sphere of the radius one. Okay. And then we take the Hausdorff limit of these intersections, right? So we intersect to the small sphere, then the renormalize, then we take here it's written limit but limit means the Hausdorff limit, okay? So when we take the Hausdorff limit, and then we take the cone over the Hausdorff limit. It's one of the definitions of the tangent cone, okay? There are much more, actually. I don't want to just to present all the definitions of the tangent cone. It's a very special activity based on that. So, what we actually have is that the, do you hear me well? Yes. Okay. I just tell uh, you. So then there is a theorem of Sampaio. Theorem of Sampaio uh, saying that if you have two outer or even ambient uh, Lipschitz equivalent germs of semi-algebraic sets, then their tangent cones are Lipschitz equivalent, also outer and ambient. Okay, so this Zampari theorem will be the main tool to see what what actually happens in three-dimensional case. So let me go to three-dimensional case and uh, show you the special examples. Okay, so uh, just a few words about the drawing. What actually do I draw when I uh, present the picture? Uh, when I present the picture, what I'm doing, I do the following. I take the intersection with a small sphere, okay? And then what do I do? I consider 
let's say, uh, the dynamics of this intersection. So when we have this kind of, uh, this kind of points, it means that they, these points, in the intersection to the small sphere, they are coming one to another faster than linear or with some rate. So this is what do I mean by the drawing. So then we have the surfaces, the semi-algebraic surfaces, such that we here, here you have a pair of points with the exponent bigger than one. And here we also have the uh, a pair of points just coming together faster than the exponent when, than conically. Conically means with the exponent one. So when we come in this example to the tangent cones, what do we see? In the example one, the tangent cone comes to be like this. And the ex in example two, the tangent cone looks like this. Okay, so this is an example A, and here is example B. So what do we have here? What do we have here? Then uh, just, then the tangent cones are even not topologically equivalent. Okay, then the tangent cones not topologically equivalent, ambient topologically equivalent. From the other hand, from the other hand, when we consider these two surfaces and we take away these regions, this region and uh, this region and that region in the example A, and that region and that region in example B, when they, we take them away, what do we see? We see that everything behaves conically. And here, when we take gamma plus and gamma minus, and here gamma plus and gamma minus, then locally, these two things are by Lipschitz equivalent here, and they are by Lipschitz equivalent here. That, and that means that the examples over here are outer by Lipschitz equivalent. Okay? So, here we have germs of surfaces in R to the three who are outer by Lipschitz equivalent. And just, uh, but from, what, what do we have from the topological viewpoint? From the topological viewpoint, topology knows nothing about these regions. And from the topological viewpoint, uh, they are just circles, okay? So then there, there is absolutely no topological obstructions. So we have that they are topologically, ambient topologically equivalent, outer Lipschitz equivalent, but not ambient topologically equivalent because the tangent cones are also not ambient topologically equivalent. So then these were first steps of the theory. And let me show you another example. Another example uh, looks like this, that when we take just, let's say, the connected sum of two or three foil nodes, right? When we take the connected sum and the two, two or three foil nodes, and over here, we take a pair of curves, and over here, you take a, a pair of curves, then these two examples, as I told that uh, from the outer by Lipschitz viewpoint, this piece 
and this piece are the same, then the same that this piece and this piece are the same, right? So they are outer uh, by Lipschitz equivalent and uh, uh, just, and the topology is the same because it's just a connected sum of uh, the link is the connected sum of two three foil nodes. So then these examples were basic and I also guess uh, these are examples in R to the four and I will uh, show you that in R to the four actually the zoom is much more interesting and really much more rich than in dimension three. But uh, before I start uh, the theory in R to the four, let me make two conjectures. Two conjectures and uh, two open problems. Uh, let's say relatively open, because I actually, I, I, th I guess that I know the answer, right? But from the other hand, nobody proved. For instance, so for surfaces, for surfaces, for germs of surfaces, of surfaces, in R to the three, for a given, ambient topological structure and alter by Lipschitz structure there are finitely many only finitely many ambient by Lipschitz structures. Or by Lipschitz classes. Okay, this is conjecture one and the conjecture two that if X is L and E, so Lipschitz normally embedded, then the outer, the ambient, To uh, Lipschitz class is unique. So that is why I actually was talking about Lipschitz normally embedded things that why do I think so? Actually, uh, how would I prove that? I will start from the proving of the uh, conjecture two. And then, uh, then we have a, a pancake decomposition of cortica. So that uh, as uh, you have a convex set that uh, just any kind of uh, polytope, you can cut it into finitely many convex polytopes. And then for the uh, for, for, for a quasi-convex or a Lipschitz normally embedded, the structure is unique. So then uh, the question is, how do you uh, put together the Lipschitz normally embedded pieces? You see, just take a look what happens here. Just if we just forget about these regions, right? Then we have uh, just a decomposition into Lipschitz normally embedded pieces. Then, actually, if we have something which is outer by Lipschitz equivalent to that, 
then it has to preserve this kind of decomposition. So that if we prove that there is nothing in the L and E case, then the, the answer is just a combinatorics. Okay, that I, I, I say that it is a way how I would prove this conjecture. But if someone will uh, just, will interest, I'm happy that if he, if he will do that, okay. <laughs> just, you know, and then uh, this is a way how the uh, set of the collaborators was coming, uh, was growing actually. Because when I was giving talks, then the people were thinking, okay, I can prove that. <laughs> then they started to prove and then, uh, you know, with this, with, with this proofs, uh, the theory became more interesting. That actually some proofs were wrong and uh, that uh, has happened. That just, I, I would uh, have to confess that just there is a big difference between this talk and the previous talks by Roberto and by uh, Juan Jose, that uh, the, they were speaking about the developed theories. And this theory is, uh, let's say, is extremely undeveloped. So that we just uh, found a phenomenon, right? We found a phenomena, and uh, then if somebody wants to work on that, then he is extremely welcome. And I will give more conjectures actually when I, I, I will talk a little bit more. Okay. Now, what happens in R to the four? The, the, the situation in R to the four is quite different. So that uh, this is, uh, the, the, all the cases which I was talking about here, they are a little bit of finite type, as, as I would say. So that, and then in dimension four, the situation changed drastically. So let me just formulate two theorems. I would call universality. Due to myself and Misha Brandenburski. So, It is the following. Uh, I, I, let, let me describe it in the words that actually when we speak about universality, what does it mean? That uh, there is a sort of universal embedding of one theory to another. So that universality theory says that you have the, uh, another kind of theory which is a node theory. And there is an embedding of the node theory to this kind of questions. And that this somehow approves the name of metric node theory. So. For each not. There is a surface a germ of a surface of a semi algebraic x to the key such that F 
first. The link of x key at zero is a trivial node. Trivial node. Second, so that you would think that the link of xk is k, no. The link has nothing to do with k. Second, and in particular, all xk's are ambient topologically equivalent. Second, all x keys germs, germs, yeah, 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 yeah. There is a germ. The germs are ambient. There is a germ of surface x k, right? So that x k, oh, if you want, it was like right like this, x k zero. So all x keys are. Outer by Lipschitz equivalent. And the last one XK1 is by Lipschitz ambient. Okay, let's say XK1 is by Lipschitz ambient <coughs> equivalent to XK2. If and only if x k one, k one and k two uh, ambient topologically equivalent as knots. So that, in, in, in particular, it means that the knot theory is embedded to this metric knot theory. Okay. Okay. I I I will uh, just uh, a little bit later. I will speak about the proofs. Okay. So that how we can put that inside, so that how do we put this X case? It, it somehow needs some special construction. Okay, that I will talk about that just probably in 15 minutes. So then this is the first universality theorem. And then there is a second universality theorem. Means for any knot k, there is, there are 
infinitely many. Surfaces, germs. Okay. Let's say y key, y key, y i key, such that that first the link. Y key is key. So that we always speak about the germs of surfaces in R to the 4, right? So the links are uh, curves in uh, S to the 3. Second, all Y, I, K. Uh, outer Lipschitz equivalent and three why I key is ambient by Lipschitz equivalent to why J key if and only if I equals to G. Okay, so that for any topology, one can find a sequence of infinitely many nodes, or infinitely metric nodes, of infinitely many germs of semi algebraic surfaces such that you have that. Okay, so now, so let me just speak about. Uh, the idea of the proof of theorem two first. So here is what do I mean by a bridge construction? So that uh, as well, what this drawing means. This drawing means the following. Here we have two. Uh, the, the as you know, I always draw the section. That just how do I intersect my surface with the sphere of radius epsilon, right? And what do I have here? Uh, it's just two lines, and uh, such that the exponent of that equals to beta, so that. You have this kind of piece, and this uh, corresponds to two, let's say, triangles, such that the distance between them is going with the rate beta. And here there is a broken bridge, so that I just remove. Oops, what is what is this? Ah, okay, here I just remove a piece over here, and I remove the piece over here. So I remove over here, and then I just put something inside with the exponent Q, right? Such that Q is bigger than beta. So then this is the element of the surgery that I'm going to use. Okay, and what? happens next, here in these pictures, you see the, uh, our bridge. Here is the bridge in A, and here is the result of the broken bridge. And uh, here you have a bridge, and here you have the result of the broken bridge. Not really any node. That I, I, I start with the unknot, unknot A and unknot B. And uh, what happens over here? 
that I have a bridge over here, okay? And what is the difference between B and, B and A? That uh, here I didn't twist. And here I twisted two times. And when I apply the broken bridge surgery described over here, what do I have? I have uh, just, I just replaced this piece by that piece. So what, uh, well, I'm sorry, it's over here. So that here, when I, uh, before the replacement, these two things were unknotted. But here I twisted. And when I just see what happens after the broken bridge surgery, uh, when here there are two cycles which are not linked. But here we have two cycles which are linked. And uh, since I can twist infinitely many times, I can have, and uh, everything like this will have uh, the same ambient topological structure, the same outer bilipid structure, but the number of twists will uh, just reflect on the linking number of the picture that I will have later. Okay? And uh, there, here I can change the linking number as I can do it. I can have any possible linking number. And of course, I, this construction, I can realize in any uh, starting knot, okay? So I have a knot over here. I just, uh, uh, this is a th three foil knot, and this is the three foil knot, but look, uh, this construction can be applied for any kind of knot. This construction can be applied for any kind of knot, so then I, uh, using this replacement, I can get infinitely many ambient by Lipschitz types, okay? So this is the idea of the proof of theorem two. So, and uh, look that uh, over here, I just started from the random picture. I just uh, took the three foil knot and uh, this was good any so that uh, just you could have any knot key. And, Okay, and then uh, what about the proof of theorem one? It's uh, somehow funny that uh, we, uh, when I prepared these notes, I just, uh, actually not me, it's Andre who prepared these notes, and then we were sure that for the proof of theorem one, we will need the, uh, this kind of broken bridge construction. But actually, uh, the story can be done uh, just using, using uh, some pi theorem. Let me see if I can explain this here. Okay. So, here in this picture, the knot can be any knot. And what, is, uh, what do we see here if we just see the microscope? We make a knot, right? We make a knot. And then we make a doubling of this knot. So we have another knot just parallel to that one. And then what do we do? We just take a neighborhood over here. And instead of what we had before, we replace it by 
the pair of the curves with the very high contact. So, when we have the tangent cone, the tangent cone here will look like this. So this is the picture of the tangent cone. So the tangent cone will be almost the cone over this double knot just pinched in one point. Just pinched in one point. So what we have here, and this is the tangent cone. of x k. This uh, is a t zero of x k, but it's clear that this tangent cone actually depends only on the knot k. This tangent cone depends on, okay? For each knot, the tangent cone depends only on the k. So then, because uh, we have just slightly moved one node from the another that, uh, which uh, actually lives in the small torus around the node K. So then these two things are ambient equivalent if and only if K1 is the same as K2. So then we have that theorem that uh, we make this construction just, uh, and uh, then I refer to the Sampaio theorem. I come back to the Sampaio theorem. Okay. Okay. That uh, the turn, if you have two ambient. Lipschitz equivalent <coughs> sets, then the corresponding tangent cones are also ambient equivalent. So this is, this gives this kind of universality. Actually, this proof is just the, mo the most recent proof just given by Andrei Gabrielov. Before we had much more complicated proof using uh, this kind of Rademeister movies, but uh, just in order to construct any knot, but uh, finally it was useless. So now I just, I told you basically everything that I know about the subject, and uh, this is what I wanted to stress, that uh, just in comparison to what uh, Juanjo and Roberto were saying, this subject is relatively new. So then, uh, just the most of questions who live over here are just open. So, who are the invariants? Of, the, of this ambient Lipschitz geometry of surfaces. Are they an analog of Jones polynomials? Should be, right? Probably some Vasiliev theory is behind. Because uh, actually, when we speak about the tangent cone, why do I think about Vasiliev invariant? When we speak about the tangent cone, 
we go through single nodes. And uh, actually, the Vasiliev invariants are made by the deformation of one node to another node, just through the singular nodes. So then the, there should be a sort of Vasiliev invariance. And another question, and then I'm almost sure that it's true, but just probably who wants to think have to go through Agbulut thinking theory, it means that all this, the examples, are actually real algebraic. I guess it's true, but just, uh, but I think that if somebody will study what happens with, in the proof of uh, the Agbulut King theorem, that the, all the nodes are algebraic, then uh, one can come to over here. And just in the very end, I would like to mention the following results that are not related to the uh, just when Zbigniew Jelonik started to think about that, about this kind of embeddings, uh, he started to produce some just parallel theory, just uh, uh, when one has an embedding of semi-algebraic set, what kind of semi-algebraic sets can be embedded and where they, they can be by Lipschitz embedded. For instance, uh, example of, of some pile shows the following, that we can have two Semi uh, just a semi-algebraic set in a semi-algebraic curves, a semi-algebraic curve in R to the two, in R to the three, that cannot be embedded to, uh, to R to the two. Just look, if you have here just a high exponent with the curve, and then we go like this and come here. And In this case, we get a germ of a semi-algebraic curve that can be topologically embedded to R to the 2, but that cannot be by Lipschitz outer embedded to R to the 2. Okay. So then, and after that example, Zbigniew started to think that if there is a sort of uh, Whitney embedding theorem, and they actually yes, so the theorem of Gelonic, that any semi-algebraic set of dimension k can be by Lipschitz embedded to R to the 2k plus 1. And the embedding is unique Uh, 4k plus 1 is unique. This means the following, that if, we, if the dimension is sufficiently high, then there, is, there are no metric nodes. Okay? 
So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you for your attention.